Hi, this is Maya Maida, and you're listening to the Food Solidarity Podcast. Conversations with people around the world who are using the power of food to create local change. Hi everyone, and welcome back to the show. Today we'll be speaking with Cherry Attilano, founding farmer and CEO of Agraya, an organization based in the Philippines working with local fishing and farming families to build resilient and self-sufficient communities. Cherry has over 20 years of experience working with agribusiness and sustainable food systems. She's also an ambassador to the UN Scaling Up Nutrition Movement, as well as the ambassador to food security in the country of the Philippines. Agrea is one of 10 global recipients of the Food Solidarity Fund, designed to support those organizations who are responding to the global pandemic and the crisis of food insecurity. Through the Move Food Initiative, Agraya has been assisting farmers to prevent waste and loss of income as a result of COVID-19, while serving nutrient-dense meals to beneficiaries in Metro Manila. Agraya has served over 400,000 individuals during the pandemic and has saved over 180 metric tons of fresh produce from rotting. Hi, Cherry. Welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you on today. Hi, Maya. Thank you so much for having me in the show. And thank you so much also for the opportunity to share our work in a wider audience. Thank you, Cherry. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Um, Your work in the Philippines is incredibly impressive. Um, And I just want to know, what inspired you to go into agribusiness and to make a career out of working with food and farming? Have you known your whole life that this is what you wanted to do? First, because I grew up in a sugarcane farm in Negros Occidental. It's actually the sugar land of the Philippines. And at the time, growing up in a sugarcane farm, uh, I lost my, 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 my father when I was three years old. And when my father died, you know, he's been helping a lot of farmers in the sugarcane farm as, as um, in giving so much benefits on immigrant workers, or we call them sakada. Those are the people who would come to cut and, you know, to cut and put the sugar cane on the track before they become sugar. So growing up, I was always asking why on weekends I don't have children to play with because everyone is working in the sugar cane field. And then when my father died, my mom was always telling us to go and work in the sugar cane farm because you need to go to school, get good education and leave the farm after. So every weekend, I would run away from home and work on the sugarcane farm, and I really love it. I would do like fertilizer application in the farm, um, you know, weeding hectares and hectares under the heat of the sun, and after that, we would go to the irrigation canals and just like play with the irrigation system and showering under the rain or the irrigation and go to the river. So for me, it was my childhood. It was a play. It was a game, and little did I know that all this people or the kids I was actually playing with, it's not a game for them. It's work for them because they're really asked by their parents to work on the farm. And I was asking a lot of questions to my mom. And then since my father died, um, we did not have enough money to actually send us to school because my father's money was enough to just pay hospital bills for a year. And a lot of people who owe him money did not pay us because they said, oh, he's dead already. Why do we need to pay the money that we owe to the person who's dead? So we literally went bankrupt. And then my mom put put us in a scholarship center Uh, every weekend. It's called uh, ASI, Asociación de Hacienderos de Silaizarabia Incorporated. So it's like an association of sugar planters that gives scholarship programs to children and the farms. So in the scholarship center, uh, every weekend we would go there because they have a lot of trainings. They have trainings for gardening, for farming, for cooking, for baking, for sewing, embroidering, name it. You know, it's like a survival tool on a weekend. And when I was in a scholarship center, I love to read. And at the time I went to the scholarship uh, center library, library and then I get the book. The book says, if you're Filipino poor, 100% of your income actually goes to food. 70% goes to rice. It's not a meal without rice in Asia. And 30% goes to your viand, what you partner with rice. 
And the book suggests that if you know how to plant vegetables around your house, you basically can save 30% of your income. And later on, you can send your children to school and have a roof on your head. So at a very young age, I was 11. I was so fascinated. I went home. I told my mom about the book I read. And I asked my mom, can you please give me a bike on my birthday? Because we only have two gifts in a year, Christmas and your birthday. So I always need to be wiser what gift to have because my mom is pretty strict. She's a single mom. And I'm the youngest of five siblings. And we have six adopted brothers. So we're like 11, you know, being taken care of a single mom. So it's like a big family because when my father died, my mom, of course, you know, uh, doesn't want to return them to the parents, right? Because we send them to school. So I asked my mom for a bike because I want to teach farmers in Sari Sari stores. Uh, Sari Sari stores in the Philippines are actually convenience stores where the farmers would usually go on a weekend and drink and chill and have a life, you know. And I asked my mom, can you please give me a bike so that I can teach these farmers how to do gardening? My mom said, what? How do you learn gardening? I said, in the scholarship center, I read a book and we were taught how to do gardening and composting. So basically, 12 years, I already like putting up my weekend on gardening and teaching farmers how to basically plant their first vegetables and they're composting from their own kitchen. And it started from that one. And it went through and through. I built relationship with the farmers. And then I told myself, well, this is so nice because I changed their lives and their children are actually also growing vegetables, not only sugar cane. And, you know, somehow I got like so fascinated on how little I was, so naive, but actually changing lives of people. And I told my mom that one day I really want to be a Shindero. And Ashendera is like an owner of a sugar cane plantations, but I don't want to be like them because they don't take care of their people. I want to be Ashendero, an agribusiness person, but I will take care of my people. I will take care of my farmers and I will send their children to school. So it was so clear in my head growing up that, you know, I want to change the game in agribusiness. What a great story. And it really shows the power of little girls and especially little girls who know exactly what they want and they go get it. So um, that's, it's really inspirational. So you, you are definitely changing the game in agribusiness. Um, I'd like to know some of the challenges that you faced in starting Agraya and how the journey was um, to getting to the point where you are today. Oh, it was a long journey, actually. Before I started Agreya, um, I put up a farm uh, together with an organization called Dawad Kalinga. It's, uh, it's like a um, big organization before in the Philippines, helping the poorest of the poor to have housing. And I told the founder, I don't really believe in your vision because um, I think you need to teach people how to fish than giving them a fish, right? Of course, giving them housing is one, but I always believe in teaching people how to to plant, grow their own food, and build livelihood to that. So I helped them build their food sufficiency programs, and it became uh, quite big all over the country. It's called Bayan Anihan, and then I helped them build the Gawad Kalinga Enchanted Farm, where I actually learned a lot before I go to Agraya. Why? In that farm, uh, we developed like the first social enterprise model in agribusiness, and it was like more of a hub for me to learn because the farmers that we were teaching were not farmers. They were ex-convicts, criminals, and, you know, leftists. And some of them have no background in farming. And so I started teaching them how to farm. And then the farm became, like, successful for four years. We brought World Economic Forum to have event in the farm. Every year we have, like, you know, more than a 1,000 people coming for social business summit. And everything was pretty successful. And after four years... Um, I said to myself, I think it's time to go. Um, you know, the, the farm is so small for me anymore because I'm trapped with the 35 hectares of land. And I always have this vision in my head uh, how to help the Philippines on a bigger scale, right? Because when I was working in that farm, I had no salary, basically. I need to work like as a consultant under the Department of Agriculture and as a consultant under the Department of Agrarian Reform. And when I was working as a consultant, I learned that the problem of the Philippines, it's because it's an archipelago. We have 7,107 islands in the country. And I said, 
if I want to create a dent in agriculture, I want to build like sustainability in every island enter. Sustainability in terms of not only food production, but also taking care of the environment because we somehow just, you know, not doing that in the process. So um, that's how uh, I built Agrea. It's actually inspired on how to make islands um, uh, productive. But actually, I had a, a very strong motivation to do that when I was invited by Pope Francis in Vatican in 2014. I was invited by the Pope in Vatican to have like a audience with him. And during that uh, visit in Vatican, you know, the message of the Pope that time was um, capitalize on your passion. What you're passionate about right now, capitalize and make it bigger. I went back in the Philippines and then I said, I want to do something bigger. So I started Agrea in the island of Marinduque. It wasn't an easy climb. First, I'm not from Marinduque. I'm from another island called Negros Occidental. I don't speak their language. And it's not easy to go to this island of Marinduque. It's like you need to take a bus for six hours and you need to take a roro or a boat for three hours. And in the middle of the night, the boat would collapse and you don't know where are you in the middle of the sea. And sometimes there's no rescue to fix the Indians. So we're just stuck there for hours. And you go to the island, duck there, and get a jeepney at 4 a.m. to get to the farm where I was starting. So it was, I think, the first hurdle. Uh, I believe that agriculture is not for the faint heart, uh, for the faint hearted. And it's really like that time I was in the middle of the sea and I was like, oh, good Lord, please come on. I still want to live. I'm like so young, like 26 years old, turning 27. Kind of just like give me a life, right? <laughs> I want to do something good on a bigger scale. So now we're six years in the process. Uh, I experience a lot of, of downside in that because I'm not from the island. So for sure, you know, I experience politics. In the island, people are just ignoring me because I was nobody. I wasn't there. I am not from there. I, was born, I wasn't born there. And I have really no uh, stronghold in the island. And then uh, every time I go to, for example, government offices, they don't give me data because who am I for them to trust to give them data? And in the first place, there's no data. So, <laughs> so I really exhausted all my money and, you know, to gather data on the island. And, but I think it was so hard. But the most powerful, I must say, that kept me alive during those times are the farmers. I stayed in the island in the first visit. I stayed in the island for like a month and I immersed in the farmers and the fishing communities. So every morning I would walk to the farming communities and they would offer me coffee, offer me breakfast, and they would always say, uh, Ma'am, pasensya na po kayo sa aming kahirapan. That's in Tagalog. In English, it's like, uh, Ma'am, I'm so sorry um, because we're so poor. So I was like, why are you sorry that you're poor? You know, why are you even like sorry? And now you're offering me coffee. You're, you're cooking breakfast for me. And you're offering me to sleep here in your house with the best pillow and the new sheet of, of you know, linen on the bed. And I said, wow, this is like pure generosity that I experienced in these farmers that they don't even know me. I don't even know them. And when I go to the fishing communities, um, in the afternoon, I would watch the, the women like hanging or, you know, um, uh, trying the fish from their husband's uh, harvest and uh, catch. And I would drink like tuba. It's, um, it's called coconut wine in the Philippines, tuba with them and dre and sing karaoke <laughs> with them with Frank Sinatra my way while grilling tuna. So I said, these are like so genuine and this is what I want to do. And yeah, I keep pushing forward. And now for six years, I did not even imagine that we put the island on the map, not only the Philippines map, but also in the global map. Yeah. That's incredible. What a, what a beautiful <laughs> story, um, really. How has the... COVID-19 and the year 2020 forced you to rethink some practices or models that you have previously established um, and where do you see the biggest challenges um, in your work and then also there's opportunity to evolve as well. 
Uh, before the 2020, actually, uh, my company is suffering so much like financial damage because, you know, there's always like market politics that you need to enter in, in agribusiness, you know. Uh, we're losing so much money because some of our markets were gotten from us by another competitor. And then another one is there was El Nino drought in the island and we experienced like 12 months of drought. It's like a year, so all our crops were like, uh, you know, um, drying up. And we installed solar water pump for our farmers to survive. And I told my team this uh, 2020, early 2020 during our planning, I said 2020 is our year. And COVID happened. I was like, holy moly, how can this be our year? <laughs> and then, you know, but sometimes uh, in, in desperation, I guess, and irritation on why things are happening, we're also so inspired to start something. So when the lockdown was declared by our president, that there's a lockdown in Manila, I said, well, we're done. Our business is totally done. And I said, okay, so 2020 is not a year. But then, you know, overnight, the lockdown was implemented and so many farmers were like asking for help or to, to bring their produce. And then I went to the supermarket. I couldn't even like buy a simple vegetable because the, the, the shelves are empty. People were like panic buying and hoarding. And I said, oh, wow, we need to do something. So a call from a pineapple farmer every day, this pineapple farmer, uh, Kuyasane Reyes, his name, I need to be specific, um, was like calling me all the time to help him because he borrowed money from a bank and to plant pineapple. And then he said uh, he needs to harvest pineapple by April or end of March because he needs to pay the tuition and the graduation of his daughter. So I said, oh my goodness, how can I sell this pineapples? And then I, we help him to sell his pineapples. And then we actually launched a movement. It's called Move Food Initiative. And... You know, I, I asked a lot of friends for help. I put it in my social media. The moment that we brought the pineapple here in Metro Manila, I was a porter. I was a seller. I was like howling like 2,000 pineapples every two days. And I asked help from friends. And actually one of the friends that uh, who saw us in our posting and helped us until now is, uh, he, you know, she will be part of this podcast. Um, her name is Steph Karandang. Uh, I, I really just admire this wonderful lady because, you know, the moment I put an announcement in, in social media about pineapple and helping us to get movers to move food from the farmers to your tables, um, this person is such an angel. No question asked. She said, I want to help. I live in this village. I want to bring sustainable, fresh food in my village. And I also want to help farmers. And I was like, are you sure? This is not an easy game to enter. Come on. But then, no question asked again. She said, I will order this much number of pineapple. And then I will, you know, let our neighbors buy it so that we can help farmers. And I guess right now, if we're saying that, you know, uh, Move Food Initiative has been saving almost, you know, 180 metric tons of fruits and vegetables, I guess. A um, huge percentage of that is because of this lady, yeah, Seth Karandang. <laughs> so for everyone who's listening, let's introduce Seth Karadang. Seth has over 15 years of experience collaborating and working with rural communities in the Philippines. She's currently a trustee and advisor for the Community Development and Gender of the Philippine Reef and Rainforest Conservation Foundation. She has also been engaged as a gender specialist for the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization, as well as the UNDP. Hi, Seth, and welcome to the show. Hello, Maya, and hello, Cherry. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy to ha be able to open up the conversation and have you um, your insight as well, Seth, so thank you for being here. Uh, one question I have for you is, what is the role that women play in agriculture, whether it's specific to the Philippines or also around the world? Well, based on my experience um, globally, and especially for countries that where agriculture is a key economic driver, 
I feel, and, and also this is a fact, that women do a lot of productive work in agriculture, but their contributions are often not recognized or valued. Whereas men, um, the work that men do for agriculture, this is recognized and this is, they are registered as the farmer, as opposed to maybe the woman is the farmer's wife. And so it is the, the man who does get paid for the work that he does in agriculture. So these kinds of inequalities, you can find this globally, and it's really brought about by you know, societal and cultural norms that unfortunately still exist in um, agriculture and in the rural sector. So in the Philippines, I think, um, if you look at statistics, it's like three, three quarters of farmers are men and like one fourth are women. But because of what I shared earlier about um, how women's work is not really recognized, it's kind of not accurate. Uh, it doesn't really reflect the, the work that women do in agriculture. So for example, if they were to like um, clean the fish and package the fish and market it, it's kind of considered as part of their household chores. And they're actually not the registered um, fishermen. And this is really problematic. And often you will hear of Filipino rural women as being like, they're invisible. They're the invisible farmers. I'm sure Cherry has heard this many times. And, and for me, it's really problematic because it makes it difficult for women to access um, resources such as like funding or training because like, they're not even the one registered in the first place, right? And also, you know, gaining control of assets such as land, for example, um, you know, that also limits their productivity. And um, yeah, and for me, it, it negatively impacts the sector. So I think personally that, you know, excluding women, it's, it's a missed opportunity for the sector to grow the agriculture sector and the local economy in general. Yeah, I, I totally agree with Seth that, you know, it's like a big missed opportunity in the agriculture sector because I always believe for 22 years, we've been working with farmers in the Philippines and also, of course, my work with the uh, United Nations, right? I'm really pushing for farmers' rights and benefits, especially the women. Um, every investment you do in a farming community, especially to women, it's actually an investment to the entire community. Because uh, the women are the ones, you know, budgeting at home, cooking food at home. And most of the time, they have, like, strong, um, what's this, dream for their children. So they always, like, make sure and make it happen and how their children can be schooled, how their children can have nutritious food on their table, how, you know, uh, they can live a decent life somehow. So I totally agree that, you know. Uh, we need to really empower and enable more of our invisible food producers who are the women in the agriculture sector. Yeah, I think I want to add a little bit, Cherry. You know, um, it, it's my experience also on the ground that when you empower a woman, you really empower her community because there's even global studies that show that when you put like money in, in the woman's hands, like it really goes to um, things like what you said about food, health, and education for the family. So it, like, it just goes back to the family and to the community. Whereas if men had the money, it would go to other things. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. I always found that quite interesting that women tend to budget really well um, and they're usually the recipients of microfinance uh, loans as well and i mean i know when my grandparents moved from india to the united states my grandmother was in charge of the budget and somehow she managed to keep it to like 20 dollars a week or something like that in in the u.s um and remarkably frugal uh even with a family full of kids and her mother-in-law uh so yeah um it's interesting. And uh, one other question, one other group that you guys tend to work with at Agraya um, are the youth. And I'd like to know what's the, what's so important about engaging the youth in agriculture and why should we make farming something that's that's cool and that's um, fun and and sexy in a way? 
Oh, it's it's because right um right now the the world is actually getting younger and younger. For example, but the farmers are getting older. They're, I call them endangered species actually. Like for example, in the Philippines are like 57 years old average age of farmers. Uh globally it's around 60 years old. Give them 10 years from now who will actually feed all of us, right? And our population is insatiably and exponentially growing in every corner of the world. So when we will not empower our young people to go back into agriculture, uh, there's no food production that might happen in the next 10 years. And it's a big, big problem in the global economy and also you know, supporting our, our population. But more than that, um, we're talking about fourth industrial revolution, right? About IoT of things, about everything. Now it's like tech, robotics, and everything like that. But when you have very old farmers who are not adept to this because of their age and because of their inability also to adopt to new technologies, uh, it will be so hard for us to actually implement all these dreams you know, that we want to do in tech. And second one, um, it's easier to, to, learn, to teach younger people about sustainability than the older farmers who've been like, oh, they would always tell you, oh, you're 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 just coming my way i'm already like you know gone i'm like finish it so i don't believe in what you're doing about sustainability and you know especially like for example sometimes when you discuss sustainability to the farmers they said oh, we will not listen about and understand about sustainability because the noise in our stomach is louder because of the hunger you know the hunger and the noise in our stomach and our family's stomach is louder than the word that you're talking about sustainability but if you're discussing it with the young, they're like, oh, how is it to be an environmentalist farmer? It's like agraya, right? The word itself is like agriculture plus Gaia. It's a Greek word for Mother Earth name, Gaia. So we said like, oh, you know, it's agriculture about envi an environment being best friends on how to focus on sustainability. And when we teach that to young, younger people, they're always like, oh, they're so interested how they can be part of creating sustainability, how it's easy for for them to understand what sustainable development goals are all about and also new technologies in sustainable agriculture. You can see the excitement in their eyes and you can see that they're willing to be involved in the agriculture sector. And the third point I think is more on innovation. Uh, agriculture is a sector that if you don't innovate, you cannot glamorize agriculture or else we'll just be you know, sitting in just a normal way of little production and unsustainable conventional production. But if you work with younger people, they're more aware of where the world is leading. They're more aware of climate change. They're more aware of somehow financial literacy. That when we teach all these things to them, they're really like somehow implemented and they're so excited to actually share it to their entire community. And somehow, sometimes uh, they, they create clubs of youth in their community that could also implement what they learn, especially, you know, Agri has a farm school where a lot of young people are actually involved in, in agriculture. I just wanted to add that um, apart from the aging uh, Filipino farmers, you also see them actually discouraging their kids from going into agriculture, you know, like, no, don't be a farmer like me, you'll be poor, you should find a greener pasture. So we see that all the time as well. So again, Cherry's question, like, who is going to feed us, right, in like 10, 20 years? So, yeah, it's really, it really is, has to be part of the strategy to engage the youth in agriculture. And, and Cherry has this really nice saying, you know, make farming cool and sexy, right? That's what they always say in Agraya, which I think is great. And, you know, making it attractive, I think, is better understood by the youth because, they have a broader um, understanding of farming as beyond that, beyond tilling the soil, you know, farming, you know, for the old generation is like, yeah, it's like tilling the soil is hard work, it's hard labor, but there's so many aspects of it. You know, if you look at the value chain, they can, you know, produce, um, they can value add and, and produce goods and services. There's the logistics side and um, transportation and marketing and all of that. And, I think, you know, today's youth is um, more equipped to get into, maybe we call it the business side of agriculture or agribusiness. And yeah, a lot of opportunity there because for sure, you know, food will always be like important and essential, right? 
you can't do away with food. I would have to agree that it seems that the younger generation is much um, much easier to engage when it comes to teaching about things like permaculture and agroforestry and just sustainable techniques in general. Um, and I think that that really is a blessing. And yeah, I think when we think of agriculture, or at least I think of agriculture, I tend to, you know, think of the actual act of planting and harvesting food where not not so many of us think about the logistics and and the fun side of agriculture which is you know really a businessy side that is 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 rich in in opportunity for individuals around the world so thank I also think that this pandemic has really kind of shown a lot of us that we need to really pay attention to the food system and how food is getting to our tables and into our bellies. Um, one interesting model from Agraya is the one island economy. Um, and to me, it kind of reminds me of like a circular economy and self-sufficiency. So I was wondering if you could um, go into a little bit more detail about that, Cherry. and. Um, and and why that should that's so important to have in the Philippines. Yeah, it's a very exciting model actually and how, you know, to create this one island economy that is based on agribusiness and sustainable agriculture because living in a country where we're separated by island, you know, our, our archipelago right, one of the greatest problems actually in agriculture is supply chain. It's so hard to logistically transport food because not all islands are actually producing the goods that they 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 need in the island but somehow uh, they have the capacity to actually produce it but they're just like dependency on other bigger islands that they will produce it and as smaller islands will just be dependent from them so when and then second one is philippines uh, we're experiencing 20 to 21 typhoons in a year so every time there's a typhoon happening, there's always like um, supply of food being hampered, you know, to, to go to the next island. So in that aspect, uh, I actually learned this because when I was around 23, it so happened that I had visited 81 provinces of the entire country. And I somehow visited all over the country because of my work with agriculture and agrarian reform. And I said, oh, there are some islands that actually they can produce a lot. You know, they can produce rice that they feel they, they couldn't. So the one island economy model is uh, anchoring on three major goals. It's about zero waste, zero hunger, and zero insufficiency. The zero waste uh, I'm telling is not only about the waste on plastics and the waste on on, on the road and on the streets. It's also, of course, you know, ocean waste, for example, we're trying to teach our people in the island to take care of. But it's really about how to utilize farm waste. So, for example, uh, in our work in Marinduque Island, our first island that we work with, when we first work with the farmers there on rice, every time they harvest rice, they were burned. They were going to burn the rice straw. And when we operate in the island, they're not allowed to burn the rice straw. Uh, in communities we work with, they are encouraged to actually decompose the rice straw and plow it back to their soil so that in the next cropping season, they can actually save 20% of fertilization costs because there's already an organic matter back to the soil from their last harvest. And um, the zero hunger is not about the hunger of the stomach or physical hunger because physical hunger, you know, you can just eat rice and, and a vegetable and after that you're okay. But this is about the lasting hunger, the hunger to belong, the hunger to be dignified, and the hunger to be respected. And I'm talking about our food producers because it's a crime that the producers of the food in the food chain are the poorest and the hungriest. And we just allowed it to happen for centuries and ages. So for me, dignifying and respecting our food producers is one of our goals. And lastly is zero insufficiency. Uh, zero insufficiency is about uh, studying the import and export of agricultural commodities uh, entering and going the island. So, for example, in Marinduque Island, the island is known for coconuts. Uh, we have more or less 4 million coconut trees in the island. So, what we're trying to do is 
uh, how to increase the income of coconut farmers because coconut farmers and rice farmers in the Philippines are the poorest farmers. So for example, coconut farmers are only earning around $60 every 45 days. And if they have eight children, that's nothing. You know, and every typhoon, they lost 20 to 30 trees, wipe out every blow of the wind. And now you're having, you know, vicious cycle of poverty and poverty generational, actually, of poverty from the grandparents to them. So what we do in Agria and Zero Insufficiency is how can we do value addition from this coconut? So we do organic coconut sugar. Um, we introduce diversified cropping. So under the coconuts, uh, we can plant superfoods like ginger, turmeric. Uh, we can do vegetable production and organic poultry and livestock so that they're not only dependent from their coconut, but they have other sources of income. So on another hand also, if they have a highest importation, for example, the island imports rice. So we study, is the island um, uh, viable for rice production? And then we found that it's viable. So we work on interventions. So what's the lacking? Um, you know, piece in the formula. So, okay, if there's no infrastructure, we work with the government to do like irrigation infrastructure or, you know, um, good seeds, good technology and sustainable ways and technology in their farming system. So, so far, we've been uh, a bit successful in some aspects of the work, but others is still a lot of work uh, because it's not easy. You deal with behavioral and mindset change of farmers. At the same time, you also deal with so much uh, politics around because at the end of the day, you know, uh, I need to be honest with this. Somehow, the farmers are always dependent to politicians, especially local politicians. This is, I think, uh, a global problem uh, because most of the time, you know, empower the farmers, the politicians would lose their voters. So <laughs> it's another layer of work that we're actually tackling. So, of course, you need to somehow, like, navigate and be good in negotiating and relationship building. So, uh, in every island we operate, I don't vote. You know, I don't vote because the moment I vote, it's like a threat to the politicians that Cherry can vote here. So, she has influence to the farmers also, or she might run into, you know, uh, in a political arena in the future. That's why she's working with farmers. So as much as possible in this one island economy model, I have objectivity in, you know, in me as a person. And at the same time, I need to build relationship with academe in the island, the government in the island, and more importantly, the farmers and the fishers in the island. Um, what Cherry shared about, you know, zero waste, uh, zero hunger and zero sufficiency. I think these are really aligned with uh, what we call a circular economy model, which is really about um, like a closed loop economy, wherein you know your raw materials, your inputs, um, your products. Um, they the idea is that they lose as little value as possible as you go down the line, and unfortunately, you know our current food system is quite wasteful. It's linear, wherein, you know, we take, we use, and then we throw it away, right? So we're not there yet. But um, what Sherry is sharing is, um, for me, like, sounds really sustainable and um, going towards a circular model. And, and because when we, when we go through a linear model, um, there's many lost opportunities, I think. And there's also a lot of social and environmental, um, like, negative impacts that happen as well. So I think this is kind of the direction that we should take. And if you apply um, circular economy to the food sector, for example, I think it's about um, Cherry's example about the growing the coconut and you know um, with the turmeric and ginger. It's it's about growing food in a way that is not harmful to the environment or biodiversity, right? Because that's what's needed. So you grow it, but you keep the soil in mind, you keep, you know, regenerative practices in mind. So that's, that's one, one aspect. And also, um, Cherry mentioned about, you know, zero hunger and food security. And, and food security is not just, you know, quantity of food, we're also talking about quality of food and nutrition. So it's not enough that, like, we produce enough food, like, this has to be 
food that is nutritious for, for our people, right? And yeah, lastly, on food waste, it's, it's, we have to make the most out of food. Um, in fact, I think there are studies that show that if there were no food waste, there's actually, there would actually be enough food to feed like everybody on the planet. But because there's so much food going to waste, um, this isn't um, happening. And I think cities such as Manila, where Cherry and I are both living now, um, cities have a big role to play when it comes to food waste because number one, they are the market for the food. And this is, you know, this is our experience with move food. And cities are also produce a lot of waste, right? So we need to manage that here. Otherwise, that's going to flow to the oceans, to, to all the productive land. So, yeah, it's, it's really challenging. And I agree with Cherry, there's a lot um, to be done. But I think if we have these um, models or examples in, in our islands, which are existing, I think, you know, it, it's a matter of investing so that these could be probably, you know, scaled up and expanded. Cherry, you're one of the 27 ambassadors of the UN Scaling Up Nutrition Movement, which seeks to eliminate all forms of malnutrition across the world by 2030. So imagine that world in 2030 where we have eliminated malnutrition. Imagine this, this utopian future where we've accomplished all of the SDGs. Um, what does the global food system look like? And what was your role in, in getting it there? Wow, that's a very prophetic question. Hopefully we can get there because we only have 10 years to deliver the SDG and with this COVID pandemic, what a challenge. But I'll try to answer the question. Um, I think when we get there, I would see a global food system that is so fair. No one is actually hungry and not only hungry, but nutrition, you know, healthy individuals. We have a very strong and healthy human capital in every corner of the planet. And then our environment is thriving while we're producing our own food. Our carbon footprint is minimal because we try to source local, support our local farmers, eat healthy and focus on organic and natural farming, permaculture kind of way of farming. Going back to how we started in the first place. And then um, greed in the sector of business is also lessened because the trading happening all over the world, actually, I must say, that's causing a lot of wastage and a lot of imbalance in the food systems. Um, yeah, when the system is balanced, I could see birds and bees flying around us in our farms, in our, in our gardens, <laughs> because there's balance in the food system. And more importantly, I could see a lot of cottage industries thriving, not only big mega corporations controlling the food. And I could see people learning how to grow their own food and utilizing everything from their own kitchen waste. So yeah, it's it's very healthy and happy world to live in. <laughs> yeah, I would like to live in what Cherry just described. <laughs> it sounds amazing. <laughs> yeah, I think um, you know, with the pandemic came a lot of challenges um, with regards to our food and agriculture. But I think a lot of the challenges were kind of already there, even before the pandemic. And the pandemic sort of highlighted a lot of these challenges. So, you know, we talk about recovery. We talk about, you know, recovering from this virus. But I'd like to see a recovery that is beyond beating the virus. It should be a recovery that yeah, as Cherry described, you know, where everything is in balance. You know, in Philippine Reef and Rainforest Conservation Foundation, which is my NGO, we have a, our vision actually is wildlife and people in harmony for a sustainable future. And I think this is the key. Like there should be, there needs to be balance. You know, we, we share this planet with a host of other life, you know, and it's not just about us. We're, we are supposed to be the, the most intelligent <laughs> and superior being, but it's not about us. And we're supposed to be guardians and, and, protect, and protectors of, of all life. But of course, we also need to eat. We also, you know, need to live and work. 
So it's about finding that balance. And I think it's, it's really doable. And when people, you know, talk to me about zero waste and, you know, no plastic, it's as if we're talking about something new. And I always say, you know, 50 years ago, this is not how things were. Sustain, being sustainable is actually about going back, going back to old practices. How our grandfathers, our grandmothers used to shop and consume mindfully, you know, not always thinking about convenience or, you know, there's no time. That's why I need it fast. So, yeah, I think that's what's needed. Balance and, yeah, going back to some really good sustainable practices that, I don't know, we kind of lost along the way. So one thing that we believe to be profoundly true at SGM is that we can work towards this future if we connect global and act local. Can you tell me how you feel about that, Cherry, and and how your work um, kind of blends that mix of the global and the local um, in a way that we can work for, toward a healthier and um, more sustainable world? Oh, wow. That's a very uh, nice question, actually, because, you know, actually what we're trying to do in Agria and Move Food Initiative and the Agria Rescue Kitchen actually resonates a lot to the SGM value on really, you know, lo uh, acting local and affecting global because whatever we do right now, we live in a very digital world. Uh, I, I always just share it in my Facebook and my Instagram or in my social media platform. And little did I know, you know, it inspires a corner of Mexico, a corner of Brazil, a corner of Africa, a corner of Tanzania. And this is the world that we live in. The moment you do something locally, you can inspire actually so many people globally because we have access to internet. But also, it's up to us on how to send the message to the world. So for me, with the SGM support, hopefully our work in Agrea, you know, the Move Food and the ARC, will actually be elevated in a bigger audience and we're more open to share our ideas and experiences and successes, you know, towards this movement that we're trying to do in the food system. If you want to learn more about Cherry, Seth, Agraya, the Food Solidarity Fund, or the social gastronomy movement, visit www.socialgastronomy.org. Thanks again for tuning in to the Food Solidarity Podcast. See you next week.